Welcome to another episode, the third episode of Overton Windows, a podcast where we discuss the shifting range of quote unquote acceptable discourse on a given topic. Today, our topic is God help us, the transgender debate. Bob, welcome. What made you want to choose such a self-destructive avenue of discussion? I, I don't recall expressing any preference for this topic at all. <laughs> <laughs> I think this sounds like something that somebody younger than me would cook up. Yes, and I am younger than you. That's one of the reasons I like to do this podcast, because Dave always makes fun of me for being well, just a tiny bit older than he is. But now I get to be the young buck the strapping young man on this podcast, which where can we find this on your end, Bob? On my end, we can find it on the non-zero podcast feed and also on the non-zero YouTube channel. That is the part of it that's that's public. Yes. Uh, there's always a, a preview that you set up on the non-zero YouTube. Uh, for us, you can find it on our Patreon. It is uh, under the bonus episodes. All you have to do is be a bonus episode member uh, tier. You have to be at that tier and you will have access to all of our Overton window topics um, or all of our Overton window episodes, including the first one we did on Israel, Palestine, the second one we did on the UFOs. And can I say, as long as you're getting into that kind of promotional detail, uh, the way at my end to get access to the whole thing, including the part behind the paywall, is to become a paid subscriber of the non-zero newsletter on Substack. So either either way, if they if they funnel cash toward either of us. Yeah, or both. They, they get full access or both. We don't discourage that. We don't at all. Yeah. All right. Transgender rights, transgender issues, a lot of bills and laws that are being passed in Republican legislatures. I don't know. How do you want to start this? Should we talk about just a little bit of the history of the Overton window on this topic, you know, maybe pre-2012 or something like that. I don't know when this became this became such a powder keg of a debate, but I don't I don't feel like it was, you know, in the early Obama years. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I would like to uh, get in the time machine and take us all the way back to my youth way, way back uh, for two reasons. One is that this was a time when it was easier to talk about a single Overton window because the media was so concentrated, three TV networks and so on, uh, long before the Internet. And the other is I have specific memories, not of the trans issue, which just wasn't an issue. I mean, in these media, at least, you know, yeah. but of the, you know, related issue of gay rights. And, and just uh, this, this anecdote will convey uh, how much. The conversation around that has changed. It, it's a memory of a Johnny Carson. So he was the, you know, the the NBC late night show in the 60s and 70s. This memory, the memory is of Buddy Rich, famous drummer on the Johnny Carson show. And they did what was clearly a setup joke. And Buddy Rich says, you know, uh, Johnny, people often ask me what you're really like. And Carson kind of says, Hmm. And uh, how do you respond to this query? And he, and he, and he pronounces query query. He says, mm -hmm. how do you respond to this query? And Buddy Rich says like that. And people laugh. And that's the joke. I, I say you're queer. I say you're gay. And that's considered funny. And clearly, implicitly, the idea is that would be pejorative. That would be disparaging. And here's a, a funny twist on that. So I went to YouTube. I wondered, could I find this exact exchange? So I went to YouTube. I found a Carson Rich episode and uh, I searched the transcript and I started typing Q-U-E for query. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't there. But what was there was the word queen. And it turns out in this separate conversation between Buddy Rich and Johnny Carson, they had also made a gay joke. And it was, I think it was set up. Carson says, didn't you play for the queen once? And Buddy Rich says, we played for several queens. I, I mean, that's not quite as pejorative as, as I guess the first one, but <laughs> it's pretty weird. I don't know. Maybe just Buddy Rich had a thing. I don't know. Uh, but uh, anyway. Yeah, I, I that my memory of that, too. Yeah. Making fun of a presumably straight person uh, in in that way uh, was 
all over the place. You don't have to go to the mm -hmm. I mean, 70s, 80s. That's the kind of place we were in then with regard to gay issues uh, in particular. I think trans issues was more just borderline invisible unless you were part of the LGBT community. Mm -hmm. You know, it was certainly part of the Stonewall uh, you know, late 60s uprising hmm. in New York. But, uh, you know, if you read about that and hear about that, you think of that mostly uh, with regard to gay issues. Um, there was also just in the research that I've done in that time, like, you know, late 70s, th there was already this budding hostility between some elements of especially the lesbian community and elements of the trans community. Uh, there's this book by Janice Raymond called The Transsexual Empire, The Making of the She-Male. This is from when? That was first published in 1979, reissued in 1994. She, apparently, she writes in this, all female, female transsexuals, so the born, born male people who transition to female. So all female transsexuals rape women's bodies by reducing the real female form to an artifact, appropriating the body for themselves. Uh, according to this article, she contends that there is supposedly secretive presence in lesbian feminist spaces constitute an act of forced penetration that violates women's sexuality and spirit. So already at this time, there was some hostility within that community. But, you know, if you're somebody like me, cis, white, straight, male, doesn't you know, like, I, I really didn't know anything about this beyond that I knew my stepmother loved to go to Marie's Crisis Cafe in uh, Greenwich Village, where there's a lot of people in drag singing show tunes. And, Is that right? I wouldn't know. have predicted that. I know your stepmother a little. I wouldn't have. Oh, my God. She loves that stuff. Whoa. OK. Yes. Now, she has, because of her politics, since adopted a much more anti-trans agenda. I don't think she would have a problem with me uh, revealing that she was a big favorite at Marie's Crisis. But I, I, even I think the meaning of anti-trans may have changed since the 70s, right? In fact, I suspect she would object to that term, anti-trans. I think she'd say she's not against Right. Trans people being trans, she's concerned about, for example, uh, girls who aren't really ready to make the decision and maybe acting under peer group pressure, making irreversible changes to their bodies and so on. And in fact, I was thinking as you were reading uh, that that passage from the, the late 70s, that although there continues to be tension between some parts of the lesbian community and, and parts of the trans community, I don't think you would often find it expressed in those terms, right? That that was sounds like a more thoroughgoing denunciation of the trans lifestyle or community than you than you might hear today. Am I wrong about that? I think now as the debate has shifted between the trans rights activists and TERFs, trans exclusionary radical feminists, while there is still vitriol um, the attacks coming from the trans exclusionary ra uh, radical feminists or however they like to be called, they are typically like if you're J.K. Rowling or Kathleen Stock, they typically are, are I think, how you described my stepmother likely being. Uh, they support people's rights to transition. They are opposed to any kind of discrimination and prejudice against trans people. But they are what's similar is concern about female spaces, by which they mean uh, the female sex uh, species. I know all of these words like are problematic. Um, so I hope people will indulge a lot of missteps in terms of how we speak about this. Uh, so that is still a big topic of debate, specifically bathrooms, prisons, and other spaces that they worry that a predatory male 
uh, you know, born a male, now woman, uh, identify as a woman, going into these spaces. And so, so that's still, I think, the central, as far as I can understand, point of controversy and, uh, between these two groups. But a lot of the rhetoric outside of that has become much more accepting of yeah. tr tra the trans community. And in fact, on the on the lesbian trans tension point specifically, if you delve into the J.K. Rowling archives, uh, one thing she says is that she came to the defense of a lesbian woman named uh, Magdalene, who was, uh, I mean, as it happened, she was dying of an aggressive brain tumor, but uh, Rowling writes... As Magdalene was a great believer in the importance of biological sex and didn't believe lesbians should be called bigots for not dating trans women with penises, it's almost like she's saying that the lesbian community feels under assault by the trans community. The issue isn't whether the lesbians will accept the trans lifestyle, right? Uh, it's it's more that it, the lesbians are uh, some lesbians are saying that demands are being placed on them by the trans community, uh, namely that they should uh, not rule out sex with people have penises that they find unacceptable. And, and that seems to me a, a shift in itself. If yeah. that's, the you know, my research into that issue specifically, and we're kind of jumping all over the place, is that it is a caricature of. Mm -hmm the trans activist position that you should, if you're a lesbian, you should have to have sex with or be attracted to a trans woman. I, I, I saw a lot of trans activists who went out of their way to denounce right. that view and only bring up things. This is kind of referred to as the cotton ceiling sometimes only bring up that issue as a way of getting people to at least examine or think about what it is that they're doing and and reflect a little bit about their prejudices when they take this hard line i will not be with it uh, but but they always right. end with but no you never have to be attracted to right. or have sex with somebody that you don't want to like well and as usual you may be seeing you know one side takes the most extreme position put forth by anyone on the other side and makes it sound a little more typical of the other side yeah, uh, than it is. All right, let's. Well, actually, I want to say one more thing about just the history of this, and and now the history talking about going way way back and also across cultures, there has always been this issue of born uh, males feeling like they identify more as a woman or a girl, and lots of cultures have. Uh, very delineated ways of addressing that. So you have like the, I remember when I was in French Polynesia, hearing and meeting the Mahu, I don't know how to pronounce that, uh, in Tahiti. And, and there's some other word that I actually remember them being referred to. But these are typically males at birth transitioning to females and having just their own culture and their own status, um, fairly non-controversial status within the Polynesian community. You have the sworn virgins in Albania. I actually wrote about this a little bit in Why Honor Matters. These are women who are, uh, they don't identify as women and so become this third sex that is, again, that has it, its place within the Albanian cultural co uh, codes. In some ways, I think, you know, we haven't really done that as a society, at least in the United States, but I think in a lot of European uh, mm -hmm. countries as well. So this has always been a little bit more underground or framed as something else like drag or that is a difference, I think, you know, it, it's kind of I don't know why. I don't, it could be part of the Judeo-Christian uh, foundations of, of, of some of these countries and nations. It's probably that right. The, the visibility of this issue has not been brought to the forefront, really, I feel like in a major way that it becomes part of the culture wars until the 2010s. Would mm -hmm. you agree with that? It didn't hit my radar screen in a big way until then. 
I remember a kid using in fifth grade the term transsexual to make fun of some other kid. First time I had heard the word, I doubt I heard it again for decades, honestly. I mean, I, maybe I had a pretty sheltered life. You know, my parents were were pretty conservative on lifestyle issues, uh, religious and so on. Uh, but um, yeah, the issue has blossomed over the last decade, it seems to me. And become polarized and highly charged. I think I do feel like, you know, late 90s, you know, there were people transitioning. It's not that people just started transitioning. It's just, again, you didn't really uh, have a strong opinion about uh, what was going on there. Uh, certainly social transitioning. We certainly we knew about sex changes. One thing we could have done if we had delved a little deeper in the research is uh, the history of things like puberty blockers, mm -hmm. um, hormone therapy, but that's that didn't just start in the 2010s. I'm not sure when it started, but I think it has fairly deep roots. I think they've been doing it since the middle of last century. Some some version of these treatments, what they now call gender affirming care. Right. Yeah, it's become a bigger thing, and you know, it's just come to figure more prominently in kind of ideological identity and rhetoric. I mean, I know, you know, mm -hmm. I, I have a, a couple of daughters who have been out of college for a few years and it's, it's a big part of their culture. I mean, one of my daughters has a, a trans, uh, you know, roommate. I mean, not, not in a room, but, but of the several people who are sharing this apartment, one is trans. And, you know, it seems to me, my daughters take a certain delight in correcting me when I don't talk about this in quite the right way, or I forget to refer to this person as they or something. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's really like an ideological marker among other things. And I suspect that part of it has roots that are in, in a way kind of separate from the, the original transgender phenomenon in itself, if that makes sense. The part of it where there's a kind of policing of language. Policing is too strong, but it's just a, you know, an emphasis on language. I think there's a, you know, my daughters are both on one side or another of 30. And I think among, so I guess they're what, millennials? I think among their crowd, and they are, of course, their demographic is more specific than that. They're progressive and, you know, college graduates. And, and they, they, as it happens, are both in the Brooklyn cultural scene and so on. But I, I think in their generation, there is a discontent with the world that they've inherited from us maybe more from me than you. I don't know who exactly is most to blame, but there, there's the boomers. A, yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and it has to do with, for example, the way the job landscape has changed. For example, there isn't the kind of job security. The way. There's a lot of things about their lives that I think they are not delighted about. And, and I think this kind of gets wrapped up uh, in, in that. I, I don't mean to say that that is its origin, that they made up the issue. Um, but I do think that's, maybe related to the fact that being trans in this in this cultural milieu is not just an accepted thing, but a cool thing, which gets back to, I think, some of the concerns on the conservative side, that at a young age, people will be drawn to this just because it's seen as cool and do things that they'll later regret. That's the conservative fear. Yeah, I would say as ha I have a daughter also with trans friends and including some uh, people who have fully transitioned uh, once they were 18 or 19. And mm -hmm. I find almost to my surprise and delight that it is borderline a non-issue for them and their friends. They, you know, they don't get mad at you except, uh, you know, in the way that a daughter will like mm -hmm. enjoy correcting you if mm -hmm. you make a mistake. They seem to have no issues among themselves in terms of how to use the pronouns or like the confusions that they might inevitably give rise to. Like all of that is just not a big deal to them. And, you know, if we want to be encouraged, you look at the way students, young people, the Gen Zers, they are, seem to be a little cooler about all of this than the old fucks. Uh, you know, like if you if you want to be encouraged, you look at you look at that. Yeah, you look at that, and and you know, like yes, of course, my daughter is on the progressive side, but she we also she also goes to public school in Texas, Houston. You know, it's a somewhat liberal city, but like you know, it was just not a real issue. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and it, there were plenty of trans students at her high school and her middle school. And, you know, never mind if she did like a theater camp in the summer or something like that. And it just was accepted and not as fussed about as it is now among older people when, you know, the culture war stuff and the identity stuff gets wrapped up in it. In fact, to that point, I wonder if the renewed focus on racial discrimination and police violence and concurrent with that, the kind of emphasis on intersectional uh, uh, approaches to mm -hmm. uh, protest and achieving justice. If if that's one of the things that sort of brought visibility and also angry controversy to an issue that seemed like it was kind of progressing under the radar in ways that people were just, yeah, I don't know, sure, whatever you guys, whatever is, is going on, I, I hope people are being responsible and it's fine and now it's like it, it's completely uh and i and i would tr trace this around the middle uh 2014 2015 so like in 2016 do you remember north carolina passes the bathroom bill mm -hmm. that makes it obligatory to use the bathroom of your born uh sex and then and then there were boycotts by like Maybe even the NBA or something, or am I getting that mixed up with the Georgia thing? There, there, yeah, there, there were was corporate, there was pressure from the corporate level. Yeah. Yes. Uh, what people would now call woke capitalism, but very effectively made a lot of the politicians regret that they had taken a hard line against mm -hmm. uh, trans rights. Because, yeah, they lost millions and millions of dollars, the uh, North Carolina economy, because of this bill. And again, you might have thought that was somewhat encouraging, you know, like this is uh, a little overreach on the right. And we're going to get back to a place where we allow things to be handled um, locally without the state and government getting involved and without it being becoming this heated issue that gets debated on all the talk radio and Twitter and blah, blah, blah. So but that's not what happened. In fact, it kind of went the other way. And. Yeah. And I'm, I guess part of that has to do with Trump and some of the actions that 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 his administration took. But now all of a sudden you're hearing about drag queens story hour. You're hearing about mm -hmm. bathrooms. You're hearing about cancellations of Dave Chappelle and and J.K. Rowling and philosophy. You know, there's a lot of controversy in philosophy here. The UK especially seems to have this issue. There's a level of vitriol in the UK that is probably exceeds the vitriol of the the culture debate here. I don't know. What do you think after 2016, where you had this kind of backlash and a little bit of a pullback on the right? What led to, you know, where we are right now, which we can talk about? I'd say two things. One is I'm not surprised by the backlash. I mean, when you think about just the diversity of the kind of values landscape in America, you have a lot of very conservative people. And I I, I probably grew up more in this culture than you did. But uh, and that culture has changed, but there's still a lot of it. And, you know, parents, you know, they worry about their children a lot. And if you can plant in their mind the fear that their daughter will be in a bathroom and some guy will walk in and something bad will happen and he will have the protection of the law when he walks in, you can expect a backlash. And I would say somewhat the same thing about the sports issue, which we haven't gotten to. You should just expect oh, uh, yeah. the backlash. But but I would the second thing I'd say is that all of this is happening in the environment where, first of all, the Internet, but secondly, social media are kind of encouraging polarization in a sense and certainly making it easy for kind of ideological provocateurs to gain momentum. Like when, when does Jordan Peterson become a thing? I, I think yeah. he's such an interesting case because uh, first of all, the fact that he could suddenly become this phenomenon is itself a reflection of what I'm saying that there's naturally going to be a backlash. There was a lot of pent up energy waiting to get behind him. And then he used it you know, in a way that's kind of unfortunate, but again, in the modern internet social media environment, it's kind of predictable. You're going to get this kind of extreme, rhetorically provocative person who's going to succeed in, in, in gaining this big following 
And the more he talks, the more polarized things are going to get. And then you're going to get people on the other side. I mean, no, no obvious names come to mind in the same way as Jordan Peterson. But this just always works in both directions, that uh, the most kind of provocative or extreme voices have an easy time getting a big following. And then they, even though they're not necessarily representative of the other side, become depicted as representative of the other side. And so arouse even more energy. So in retrospect, it all seems not surprising to me. Yeah, except that I guess where was this pent up energy? I, I don't remember when, you know, something like bathrooms, certainly something like pronouns became this powder keg where where you stood on it was going to place you in some specific political, I don't know, ideology. I guess maybe pronouns is a triggering event because mm -hmm. what Twitter comes in like 2008, somewhere between 2008 and 2017, maybe people start putting pronouns in their Twitter profiles. That starts to be a thing. I remember this was 2014. I was in a meeting with people about restorative justice and we all introduced ourselves. None of us had ever met. And one of the young, younger people, maybe just graduated, introduced themselves. Everybody else just introduced themselves in the way, like, I'm Chandler Summers, philosophy professor. And, but this person said, you know, their name, and then they said, my pronouns are they, them. Mm -hmm. And I had never heard that before. I figured <laughs> This is when again? When is this? Like, mid-20, like, 2014, if I had to guess. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember asking another person at the meeting... What 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 did that student say? Is that is that some sort of transgender thing? I, I like what did that mean? My pronouns are they are are they them? And you know it was explained to me. I, I kind of think you know that's certainly what brought Jordan Peterson to the forefront, right? Mm -hmm. That was his like the first thing I can remember really even knowing who he was mm -hmm. was his his proclamation that he would not be using the preferred pronouns of his students. I don't know that if, if I could pick a single launching point that catapulted this issue for, uh, from one that was a fairly low visibility to like saturating visibility, maybe it's the pronouns. What do you think? Uh, I think that was, yeah, that was the flag. Okay. So that was the opening segment of our conversation, which goes on for nearly another hour. To listen to the whole thing, you can either become a paid subscriber to my non-zero newsletter slash podcast, which is on the Substack platform, or become a patron of Tamler's Very Bad Wizards podcast, which he co-hosts with David Pizarro, and which is on the Patreon platform. Either way, you'll get lots of other bonus content, and either way, you'll be supporting an endeavor that Tamler and I agree is worth supporting. But whether or not you take that plunge, we thank you for listening this far and we encourage you to stay alert for the next episode of Overton Windows.